Good afternoon. I'm powerless over alcohol. My name is Dave Fredrickson. <clears throat> and if uh, some of you might be curious as to why I announced myself that way, when I first got sober, that's how the old timers did it. They didn't say they were an alcoholic. That started after I got sober, you know, saying uh, that my name is so and so, I'm an alcoholic. Because the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. How do you tell a guy who's brand new walking through the door who doesn't know anything about this disease to say, oh, you have to say you're an alcoholic? I see it happen all the time in meetings. If it's a closed meeting, the question we look at him and say, do you have a desire to stop drinking? If so, yeah, come on in. You have a chair. We're welcome to have you. You know, I've seen people try to actually throw members out because they wouldn't say they're alcoholic. Well, he has no idea what an alcoholic is. He doesn't understand about the body, the mind, the spiritual part of this disease, you know. <clears throat> and uh, I've recently been going back and listening to a lot of the old timers, you know, Bill Wilson, Dr. Bob, Abby Thatcher, Sister Ignatia, Lois, uh, Ann Smith. Uh, there's some great archived uh, talks that they gave at various conventions and stuff. And when you listen to them, they get whoever announces them, they come up to the podium and they share that just like that. They say they're powerless over alcohol and they, they use their name, whatever it happens to be. Um, <clears throat> so I love that part of the tradition, you know, to carry it on. Um, one of the reasons that, that I wanted to have this meeting, <clears throat> and I love this format, that the fact that we're uh, alcoholics and Al-Anons together is uh, because the program founded together. It was a family disease. When the magic happened with Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob out in Akron, <clears throat> Bill lived with Bob and Ann Smith, and they were doing Oxford group principles, and they, they were practicing their morning prayer meditation together. And the mover and shaker behind that wasn't Bill Wilson or Dr. Bob. And if you've read some of the history that we've got, it was really Ann Smith. She was the big mover, mover and shaker. She was the spiritual one, and she was encouraging everybody to get closer to the spirit, which she had learned from her mother, and Lois also learned from her mother that had been passed down to them as part of their training, you know, to have a relationship with God of their own understanding. So it was a very nat natural transition. So from 1935, when that magic happened, uh, for the next 16 years, there was one program. We were together, the Al-Anons and the A's. And if you showed up as a newcomer at Dr. Bob's house, he'd look at you and say, where's your wife? Because most, most of the drunks were men. And they said, well, she's at home. He'd say, well, you bring her next week or I'm going to go get her myself. It was a family deal. <clears throat> and they worked the program together. Now, the, the women tended to work with the women. The men tended to work with the men because they had a very early case of 13th stepping that occurred uh, with uh, one of the earliest alcoholics and one of the the, the first female alcoholic that came in. And Dr. Bob didn't have a very good taste for that. He was pretty upset. They didn't know how they were going to work with the woman, and his worst fears were confirmed. As a matter of fact, it actually occurred on his examination table in his office. And when, when they got walked in upon, they, uh, the woman broke into the case, stole a bunch of the drugs he had in his case, and then they, he, she and the other guy jumped out the window, and they never saw her again. Uh, it probably, that 13th step probably cost her her life. You know, so... At, from that point forward, the women worked with the women, which means the Al-Anon women were 12-stepping alcoholic women, you know, because we worked the same 12 steps. And <clears throat> I just got this as a gift. <clears throat> it's a wonderful book. If you've never seen it, it's a publication from Al-Anon. It's World Service Conference Al-Anon Family Literature Approved. It was published in 1986, for those who are interested. And on page 89 of this book, <clears throat> it, control, it, it sh has a picture of the list of literature that was available from Al-Anon. And if you look down the list, purposes and suggestions for Al-Anon family groups, uh, one wife's story, the non-alcoholic, God bless them in AA, uh, <clears throat> suggested programs for meetings, suggested reading uh, about the alco alcoholic husband. Wait a minute. Can this be correct? The big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, sold by Al-Anon World Services. You know, it wasn't until 1962 that the convention got founded for, for or 61, I guess it was, the Al-Anon World Service Convention where they decided, and there was a turf war between AA and, 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 and Al-Anon, and they decided that Al-Anon was going to produce Al-Anon literature and they weren't going to use any AA literature and vice versa. And, I, and it, to me, it was one of the, the, the most shameful events that have occurred in our, in our recovery because for an alcoholic, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, this thing is where we get the 12 steps and how to work the 12 steps. That's what the first 100 were using, and that's where our program was founded. You know, and the whole purpose of the book, as I said this morning, was to prevent garbling and distortion of the message. 
And it's amazing when you read it. When we first come here as an alcoholic, we're here to get sobriety, right? Our issue is alcohol. But I always describe Alcoholics Anonymous as the biggest shell game in the world because the guy comes walking in the door looking for help with alcohol, and we all of a sudden, as soon as he gets in here, we go, and we switch the shells. And we say, this program's not about, uh, about alcohol. It's about finding a relationship with a power greater than yourself. It just so happens that the byproduct of that is you don't want to drink alcohol. So the guy comes in here thinking you're going to teach him how to drink or how not to drink, and all we do is we switch the chairs on him real quick and say, oh, oh by the way, we're here to talk about God. You know, and that's the deal. This is about a spiritual relationship. All of Alcoholics Anonymous is about a spiritual relationship. Same thing with Al-Anon, since we work the same 12 steps, right? What does the 12th step say? Having had a spiritual awakening as the result, we have one result, folks, to wake up your spirit. It's not a result. It's the result is to have this relationship with a God of your own understanding. That's the whole deal. That's where the rubber meets the road. And that comes in our step work in steps 10 and 11. That's why I wanted to talk to you about steps 10 and 11. I call the section that we're working on out of the big book, it comes from pages 83 through 88 and 164, right? So there's six pages out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. In those six pages, there's 12 prayers and 12 meditations. So... In AA, there's a, a book called The 12 and 12. It's 12 Steps and 12 Traditions. Most people call that The 12 and 12. When I'm working with my guys, when I say the word 12 and 12, they know that I mean The 12 Prayers and 12 Meditations. Because when they call me and they say, hey, Dave, I haven't talked to him in three or four days, one of the very first questions that comes out of my mouth is, how's your 12 and 12 going? How's your relationship with God? Because everything else is secondary. If, if they tell me, well, I haven't been doing The 12 and 12 and my prayer meditation life's been off, I already know why they're calling me. They're calling me because character defects have come back. They're in fear. Their life isn't working properly. If they, if, if they say, man, my 12 and 12 has been fired. I've been having some of the neatest experiences. I got a new newcomer this week. I know this is, I can just kind of breathe a sigh of relief. It's like, whew, it's going to be an easy conversation. This is going to be a neat one, you know, because I know they're, they're not in emotional distress. So part of my goal here is to teach about what does the book say, 12 and 12, what were Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob doing, Ann Smith and Lois in the, in the early days, and then give you some ideas. Because I would say that 95%, and the, I'm just pulling these numbers out of my own experience, and this is, there's nothing scientific to it. I'm just guessing. I would guess that 95% of the people in recovery were, uh, uh, pray as part of their recovery program. At some point, they're taught to pray. Most of us do that. When it comes to meditation, I would say that it's maybe a big number would probably be about 5% of people in the rooms meditate. But we're given three instructions out of the book. Prayer, meditation, and vision. And most people have never heard the expression vision. And I would say it's less than 1% that do any vision work. So hopefully I'm going to spark your curiosity to get you to look in here and, and, and understand what prayer, meditation, and vision, and what a powerful spiritual tool that is to change your life. Did everybody get a sheet, a handout sheet? No? There's some hands in the back. Would, would you come hand some of these out, guys? Make sure everybody gets one of these things. On this sheet, I've put the 12 prayers and 12 meditations. I put this thing together. And if you, have, if you haven't gotten one, keep your hand up and they'll bring you one to you. I put this thing together because of the Internet. I'd start working with guys like the, my, my buddies here who are handing these flyers out. They're from Sask uh, Saskatoon, Canada or someplace up there. How do you can, uh, they're up there, eh? You know? <laughs> I call these guys up and I'm talking to them over an internet connection, over Skype. It's a video conferencing that's free over the internet. And I'm explaining to them about prayer and meditation and they're, they're getting it and I'm having them highlight in their big book. It's much easier if I do that and I also just send them an email. So I put it into a document form so I could fire it up there to them real quick. On this sheet, I use a study edition of the big book. So if you look down at the bottom of the sheet, it says there's numbers on the front of the sheet, one, two, and three. Those are the first three prayer meditations and visions. The first number is the page number. So the first one's on page 83. The number after the colon is the paragraph. If there's a part of a paragraph that starts the page, that's colon zero. And so the first full paragraph would be colon one. It helps you find it quicker. So if you have your big book, open it up to page 83, and let's look at 83, uh, the first paragraph on, on the page. All right? Count up four lines from the bottom, and it says... So we clean house with the family, asking. Anytime the big book is telling you to ask, 
It's a prayer. We're asking God for something is the implication. So I have my guys put a square around that, that word. That tells me that this is a prayer. So we're asking each morning. That's where I get that this is, these are the 12 prayers and 12 meditations we're supposed to be doing every single day. You know, this is not an optional deal. This is telling me I'm supposed to be asking every single morning in meditation. So there's the meditation piece. So now I've got prayer and meditation that our creator, you notice that creator is capitalized, capital C. There, anytime you see a word in the big book that's capitalized in the middle of a sentence that shouldn't be capitalized, Bill Wilson is making a reference to a God of your own understanding. So one of the questions that I first throw out at people is, what is your conception of your creator? It's a wonderful meditation to sit down sometime and think, how did I get here? Who made me? What's my relationship with my creator? All right, there's your first challenge for you. If you haven't ever done that, it's kind of a neat meditation, but I don't want to get distracted. So we've got, we're, we're, we're doing this for our family. So this is the ninth, what I call the ninth step prayer because we're asking each morning for our family in meditation that my creator show us the way. Well, if I'm asking God to show me the way, I'm asking him to give me a vision of what it looks like. So there's where I get prayer, meditation, and vision, right? To show me the way of patience, tolerance, kindliness, and love. Well, what does patience look like? You know, I know what impatience looks like. When I think about it, that's what comes to my mind when my kid's coming into my office and I'm busy doing something and he's like, Dad, Dad, could you help me with that? And I'm like, what? There's impatience. There's intolerance. There's sometimes very often lack of kindness. And it certainly isn't loving. So I can hit all four. I know what it looks like not to do those things. But what am I asking here? I'm asking God to show me what does it look like to be in that exact same situation and show him patience or tolerance or kindliness in love. And one of my greatest tools that I've gotten from this book is later on in one of the stories that talks about how the alcoholic is a tornado roaring through the lives of others. Well, if I'm the tornado because I'm the alcoholic and I'm spinning, who's the first life that I hit? My beautiful wife, Brenda. She gets the majority of my abuse, all right? So I start with her and then I go from Brenda to Duke and Noah in my morning meditation. I think, what does it look like to have patience, tolerance, kindness, and love towards Brenda? All right? Once I've done that, what very often jumps into my mind is something within the last two or three days where I wasn't patient, kind, tolerant, or loving. So I make a note. I need to clean that up, whatever that happens to be. And then I get a vision in my head. I, I call them little movies. I try to get a movie of what does it look like to be patient, tolerant, kind, and loving towards each member of my family. The beauty of this thing, folks, is once you've got that vision, that video in your head, it doesn't have to change. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every morning. The first couple times you sit down to do this, it's probably going to take you 45 minutes to go through all 12 prayers and 12 meditations to gain the proper vision. Once you have it, you've got it. So I can sit down in the morning, and, and I was telling this morning at the 6 a.m. meeting, when I was talking about this, I timed it for seven days this past week to see how long I spent. It averaged for me seven minutes to do this work, right? So when you first start it, don't... Ex it's, it, it's, it's a chore. It takes a while. So you take the sheet and you take your big book and you go through and you can make little notes in the margins and stuff. But once you get it, it becomes a way of life. And I was telling them this morning because AA is not something I do. It says in a number of different places, it says that this is a way of living. AA is something that I live, right? 12 steps aren't something that I do. They're something I live. My job is something that I do. I go there and I do it in order to get a paycheck, I provide service while I'm there. It's not my life. It's not the way of life for me. It's, it's my occupation, right? This is a way of life because it's a spiritual way. It's the way I go through and, and I live my life as I live by these spiritual principles. Does that make sense? All right, so pray, we pray for patience, tolerance, kindness, and love. There's our first prayer, meditation, and vision. That's the first prayer, all right? <laughs> you notice the very next sentence on the page. The spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. There it is again. It's not something we do. It doesn't say the 12 steps are something you have to do. It says the spiritual life is a way of living, all right? <clears throat> and the reason I'm, I, I'm hammering on that so much is let me read you some quotes, all right? This comes from Alcoholics Anonymous Comes of Age, which is one of the history books from, from on the AA side, page 70, colon 3. It says, how well I remember our morning meditations when Anne would sit in the, re in the corner by the fireplace and read from the Bible, and then we would huddle together in stillness awaiting inspiration and guidance for our lives. That's what they were doing. The first 100 would get together as a group with fellowship, 
they would read some spiritual truth and then they'd think, how am I going to apply that in my life? And then get a vision for how can I make the world a better place because I'm in it and I'm sober. You know, you'll notice that that's one of my mantras that I use all the time. I tell that to every one of my guys when I, before I hang up. I say, okay, what's your homework? And I, I talk to them like a teacher. And I say, this is your homework assignment, A, B, C. And you'll see that all the heads that are nodding right now, those are the guys that I work with, you can tell. And then I'll usually say, now, give me an example. What are you going to go do to make the world a better place because you're in it and you're sober? I, uh, that's a way of life. It's a way of thought as we go forward. From our history book, Pass It On, 114 colon 1. We would sit down and try to rid ourselves of any thoughts of the material world and see if we couldn't find out the best plan for our lives for that day and to follow whatever guidance that came to us. From Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, another one of our history books, 314 colon 4. Dr. Bob's morning devotion consisted of a short prayer, a 20-minute study of a familiar verse from the Bible, and a quiet period of waiting for direction as to where he uh, that day should uh, find use for his talents. Having heard, he would religiously go about his father's business, as he put it. That's what these folks were doing. Well, if they were doing that, I've tried not doing it, and you, as you heard my story a couple hours ago, it didn't come off real well for me. It's much easier to go back and let's do, let's copy what they get. If I want what they had, I have to do what they did. That's where this came from, all right? <clears throat> Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, page 150, colon 4. They stressed morning quiet time daily, reading and daily contact. They also told me I had to do something about my alcoholism every day. All right? <clears throat> we get a daily reprieve based solely on the maintenance of our spiritual condition, as it says later on. All right? Listen very carefully to this one. I saved the best for last. It comes from Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, page 136, colon 2. The AA members of that time did not consider meetings necessary to maintain sobriety. They simply were desirable. Morning devotion and quiet time, however, were musts. We go to meetings to meet newcomers to work with so we can carry the message in the 12th step. Prayer and meditation is how we become the people. We become the spearhead of God's ever-advancing creation. And when I talk about God, I'm talking about your experience with God, your best friend. And if your God is not your best friend, if you do these 12 prayers and 12 meditations, you will find a God that is your best friend. All right? <clears throat> Flip over to page 84 in your big books. 84 colon 1. We've all heard, I'm sure, of the promises that they talk about in the, in, uh, the a lot of meetings read them. The, 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 they call them the nine-step promises from 83 and 84 out of the big book. Um, <clears throat> that's just one set of promises, folks. There's promises throughout the book. I, I'm kind of anal. I'm a, kind of an A-type, and I've written hundreds of pages about the big book and studying it. And I wrote up one day all the musts, nevers, have-tos. You know, I put them all into one document. I also put together all the different promises I found in the big book, and there's hundreds and hundreds of them. It's pretty amazing. <clears throat> but on 84 colon 1, it says, are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled uh, among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them always materialize but there's a condition to the statement and every time I come to a con conditional in this book I have my guys put a square around it it says they will all materialize if we work for them which means I have to take some action there's got to be work for me to get the promises this is no such thing as a free lunch in Alcoholics Anonymous or Al-Anon you don't just come in here and sit in a meeting and get this thing by osmosis what you will get is relief from pain but you won't have a spiritual awakening You'll, you, for that hour, you'll feel a little bit better. But when you leave the group, you'll automatically, your, your spiritual maladies start to build and you start thinking forward to your next meeting. I mean, I got to get to a meeting. I got to get to a meeting. I need, I need to get to a meeting. If that's your thought process, you're using your program as a spiritual filling station. You're coming into our meetings and you're taking off some of our spirituality to go back out and try to live life. And very quickly, that tank will run dry you have your own relationship with a God of your own understanding, you can plug into that source of power anytime, anywhere. You can do it in the shower. You can do it in the car. You can do it in your cubicle at work. You know, you can do it in the doctor's office. I had an amazing experience not too long ago. I had slipped and, and hurt my back. All right. I, I was over in London and stepped on some ice and, and uh, it fell and, and I hurt my spine and I didn't realize it. And we did some x-rays and MRIs and I'm in the, in the orthopedic surgeon's office a couple months back. And the doctor's telling me, he goes, oh, geez, look at this. You know, your spine shifted over 50% out of alignment with the rest of it. And that's where my brain shut off. I couldn't hear the doctor. 
And so I did something very uncharacteristic as I put my hand up. And the doctor says, what? I said, hang on a second, doc. I can't hear a word you're saying. And I prayed out loud. I said, God, I need you here. I need you in this room with me so I can face this. Because the first thing that I heard in my head was, your career is gone, you know, and this pain is going to be with you forever that's in your hip. You've got problems, you know. But as soon as I plugged into God, what I heard very clearly was the voice I had heard two hours earlier when I said my prayer and meditation. And I, he said, I got you. Don't worry. I didn't bring you this far. You're okay. I was able then to look at the doctor and said, I said the prayer out loud. And the doctor looked at me and he goes, his jaw was hanging open. He was literally slack jawed. He says, I've never seen anybody do that before. <laughs> I said, welcome to my world, doc. <laughs> you know, and it turns out the doctor was a believer, you know, which was kind of neat because it, it opened up a, a whole neat series of events happened because that doctor and I shared a spiritual experience together in a doctor's office. How cool is that? Only because I bring God with me wherever I go, you know, because it says on page 55, the God of your understanding is deep down within you. He's in every man, woman, and child, which means me and you, by the way. So if God is within you, even when I'm drinking alcohol, I could pick up a glass of booze right now, and God is no further away from me than he is right here right now. Yet I feel sometimes like God is the farthest from me. Where did he go? He didn't go anywhere. He's still inside knocking. He wants to have this relationship. There's something blocking me. And the whole purpose of the 12 steps and these prayer meditations is to remove the garbage, open the, the clogged drain, take out the hairball of resentment, take out the, the, the grease trap filled fear trap, you know, to open up the channel so that I can hear the voice of God and feel that expression, the God of my understanding. Does that make sense? All right, so let's continue down. So these will materialize if we work for them. This thought brings us to step 10. What thought? The thought of the prayers coming true if I'm willing to do some work. It's a conditional deal. There's no such thing as a free lunch. You can have the most powerful desire to quit drinking. Desire is absolutely of no avail, it says in our book on the top of page 23. It'll come to the point of every alcoholic desire is not enough. So what gets you a chair in a meeting isn't enough to keep you there. It takes more. It's going to take work. What is it going to take? Well, this thought brings us to step 10, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory, basically like a mini daily four-step, and we continue to set right new mistakes as we go along. We vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. I take guys to prayer and meditation when, before they're starting on their four-step, they're doing 10 and 11 on a daily basis. If you've got this big pile of crap that you've created in your drinking life and from your addiction, let's not create an entire another pile while we're over here, while we're trying to dig this up by doing a fourth and fifth step, because it's going to take some time to dig through a fourth and fifth step. Let's clean the daily stuff up while we work on the ancient history stuff as we go through. So I teach in prayer meditation right out of the get-go. And I've heard people say, well, wait a minute. You can't talk about God with a newcomer. You'll scare him off. Guess what? Alcohol will scare him right back. I'm not worried about that. My job, according to this book, is to lay the spiritual toolkit at their feet. If they want what I have and they're desperate enough to get it, they have the gift of desperation, they'll pick up the spiritual toolkit. If nothing else, I plant the seed. And when they go out there, they can't successfully drink anymore because they know the truth. And eventually, if they live, they'll make it back in here. But I digress. <clears throat> All right? This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for a lifetime. And here comes the next thing. It says, continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. I've worked with one word in Alcoholics Anonymous for over 20 years, folks. Watch. What does it look like to watch? I'm watching for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. It says, when these crop up, it doesn't say if these crop up, they're going to crop up. And if you haven't had a resentment in a week, guess what? You're going through life asleep thinking you're awake. <laughs> they're there. But we're tremendous at, at pushing those things down into Pandora's box. If it doesn't trig peg the meter, we figure, hey, I got it okay. But there's still this low-grade agitation that starts our day, and we're just kind of crabby and, uh, you know, that everybody's shaking their heads. You know the gnawing kind of, ah, uh, you get in your life? Guess what's motivating that? That's fear-based resentment. It's in your life. And it gives us a set of instructions. When these crop up, we ask God. There's another square. We're at our second prayer. We ask God to, at once to remove them, Right? That here comes your instructions. There's four instructions. First piece is we ask God to remove them. We discuss them with someone immediately. Sometimes it's the person that you got upset with. 
you know, I could be sitting there in, at 7-Eleven, right? And the person's going too slow. The lady that was in front that wanted to count the change out of her purse, and now I'm in this state of agitation. I've got this little mini resentment, and I'm up, and I'm starting to be short with the 7-Eleven clerk. And I'm thinking, come on, I just want that lottery ticket and pay my gas bill. Give me the, hurry up. And I'm starting to act short, and I can catch myself if I'm watching, and I see myself in that behavior, and that's not the man I want to be today. So I'll stop myself, and I'll go, oh, excuse me, ma'am, I'm sorry. I, I'm just having a bad day. What did I just do there? I shared it with someone immediately. I shared it with the person I was being mean to. I fulfilled the second requirement. I don't necessarily have to run and get on my phone and call my sponsor and say, you're not going to believe what I just did at 7-Eleven. <laughs> if I have to, I will. Or I'll call anybody that's in this room and say, hey, I just screwed up. Here's what I have to do about it. But anybody, any other human being, I got to get out of the, you've heard me say it this morning, I got to get out of the itty bitty shitty committee. The, the voices that are in my head, that's, if I'm thinking about it, I'm behind enemy lines. Because on the top of page 23, it says the problem centers in our mind. So guess what, folks? You have to be out of your mind to find God. You cannot think your way through, through Alcoholics Anonymous or Al-Anon. You have to experience it. And you go through these prayers and meditations to seek power outside of yourself. And the reality is the power is inside of yourself. It's deep down within and you're just blocked off from it. You've got to remove the block. All right? So we ask God at once to remove it, we, that which means a prayer. We discuss it with someone else immediately. We make amends quickly if we've harmed anyone. So I apologize to the 7-Eleven clerk. And then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. That's the hard piece. Who can I help? So very often, if I've been that way, I'll look at the 7-Eleven clerk and I'll say, you know, I thought I was having a bad day. How are you doing? Are you okay? I had that experience with the coffee lady over there. She provided me great service, and she gave me a cup of coffee, and she made the correct change, and I gave her a tip in the, in the cup, and I'm filling up my coffee cup, and I looked at her, and she had this weird look in her face, and I listened to this still small voice, and I said, how are you doing today? And she's like, I'm doing fine. Now, I hadn't done anything wrong, so I wasn't doing this particular thing, but I was bothering to pay attention to somebody outside of myself, a very unalcoholic behavior, you know? I mean, it's, <laughs> normally it's all about us, right? And she says, I'm doing fine. I said, you know, you guys provide us with great service, and if nobody's told you, thank you very much for your service today. This has been a great experience at this hotel. Everybody here has been very professional. Thank you. And you could just see her. She kind of puffed right up, and she says, well, thank you for saying that. I made the world a little better place because I was in it, and I was sober today, right? So it's easy to do once you learn how to do this. I just have a lot of experience with this because I screw up a lot. <laughs> Maybe you guys don't. <laughs> All right? Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Love and tolerance of others is our code. That's in a very powerful statement. Love and tolerance of others is our code. Huge, right? There's a whole bunch more of, of these prayers and meditations. We don't have time to cover them all, but I do want to cover one on page 85. Let's look at the next piece. 85 colon 1. It is easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our, uh, and rest on our laurels. We are headed for trouble if we do, for alcohol is a subtle foe. We are not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our meetings. No. Maintenance of our talking to our sponsor. No. Maintenance of our spiritual condition. Every day. Wait a minute. Did they just say every day? Every day is a day when we must. Wait a minute. I thought there were no musts in, in recovery. There's a lot of musts. Every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all of our activities. Do you think they really meant all of our activities? Yeah, they meant all of our activities. That's the deal. There's the vision, prayer, meditation, and vision. It's right out of the book, all right? Let's go to the top of page 86, all right? We know the book in our recovery program gives us a whole bunch of inventories to do, right? We're supposed to have our formal four-step, our formal inventory. Then we have what they call the spot check inventory, and they have the daily inventory. We've all, I'm sure you've probably all heard of those things. If you haven't, read, read the, the Alcoholics Anonymous 12 by 12, the 12 Steps and 12 Traditions, and it covers it pretty well. Look at 86 colon 1. It says, when we retire at night. Well, one of the things I did is I wanted to go back and do what the first 100 were doing. So I went back and read the original multilith that they, before they printed this big book, they wrote out a, a text and they sent it around to doctors and got some feedback. And it didn't say when we retire at night. You know what it actually said is? It says when you awake in the morning, look back over the day before. So if you look at our history, those quotes that I read to you, what were they doing? They were doing prayer and meditation in the morning to get a vision to carry through the day to be a better human being. 
So that's what I do today, is I do this in the morning. And this next paragraph, there's 12 questions that were asked here, and I've written them out for you on the back of your sheet, right? Was I resentful, right? The book says, were we resentful, selfish, dishonest, and afraid? There's four questions right there. And I've given you the instructions. If I was resentful, the big book gives us a four-column inventory, right? We write out the first three columns, and then on page 67, there is a 12 P, you notice I like the, word, this, the 12 number, 12 steps, 12 traditions, 12 concepts. Here's 12 questions. On page 67, everybody go to page 67. I'll even show it to you. <clears throat> Not 76, I'm dyslexic today. 67, right? Page 67, we're between column three and column four as the big book gives it to us, right? It says, though we did not like their symptoms, that's what we put into column two, is their symptoms, what they did that bothered us, or the way it disturbed us, what, what, the way they disturbed us is what's in column three, right? From, from inventory. Uh, they, like ourselves, were sick too. We asked God. So this is a prayer, right? We're asking God to help us show them the same. Here comes number one. I'm just going to count through the numbers. You're going to have to stick with me. Tolerance is number one. Pity is number two. Patience is number three. That we cheerfully, cheerfulness. There's number four. Grant a sick friend. Friend. What do we do for our friends? We give them leeway. But remember, we're writing inventory. We're treating them like they're some SOB that should burn in hell. No, this is telling me I'm supposed to be praying for them like a friend. I'm going to give them some, some slack. I'm going to give them some grace that we would give a friend. Uh, if that person offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? There's another prayer, right? There's number six. God save me from angry. There's number seven. Thy will be done. There's number eight. Avoid retaliation. There's number nine. Argument, number 10. We wouldn't treat sick people that way. We, if we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. We cannot be helpful to all people, but at least God will show us. Wait a minute, God's going to show us, there's your vision. He's going to show us how to take a kindly, there's number 11, kindness, and tolerant view of each and every one. Tolerant view is number 12. But wait a minute, number one is tolerance, and number 12 is tolerant view. What's the difference? I like to use an example, and it's kind of gross, but I'm going to use it anyway. Let's say my buddy is a, is a nose picker. He's always picking his nose when he's talking to you, Right? Because he's my friend, I'll tolerate the fact that he picks his nose. Because I like him, so I put up with the fact. Tolerance is something I put up with. Yet in my mind, when I think of him, my friend, let's call him Joe, I think of Joe, I think of him as a nose picker. If I have a tolerant view, I think of him as a sick child of God. I give him grace and compassion. So I no longer think I put up with the behavior, but I have to change my attitude towards him, my view of him, and have a tolerant view. Does that make sense, the difference between tolerance and tolerant view? So there's 12 pieces for this prayer. This is called a forgiveness prayer. We say this prayer between column three and column four of our inventory, right? So let's go back to page 86 where we were. It says, when we retire at night, well, we, when we wake in the morning for us, were we resentful? If I was resentful, I write out a four-column inventory, which means I really quickly write out who's in column one, what he did to me in column two, how it affected me in column three, and then I take those 12 pieces and I say a prayer for this person that I'm angry with. It can't not soften your heart. Only after I've softened my heart do I look at the four questions in column four. Where was I being selfish? Where was I self-seeking? Where was I dishonest? And where was I afraid? And when I boil that down, I come up with a fear. And I have a fear tool from page 68 that the big book gave me. And I can go give the fear tool to God. You know, give the fear. And it says, at once I outgrow fear. Fear is what's blocking the channel between me and God at that moment. I'm expressing it as anger. Anytime you see somebody that's angry, anger is always a secondary emotion. It's never a primary emotion. Something's making you get angry. And 99.9% .9 of the time for this alcoholic, it's fear. We are fear generators. All right? So <clears throat> I, there's a pretty good explanation here. So take these through and go through and read these paragraphs. One of the things that Carl taught me is don't ever let anybody read your big book for you. All I'm doing is pointing you to the big book. That's why I wrote the sheet. Now, don't use just the sheet. The sheet is the finger pointing to what you're supposed to be using. You know, if you're focused on the finger, you're focused on the wrong thing. Go to the book yourself. Take the sheet and use it as a guide to lead you through the book and have your own experience. Ask yourself the questions. What does this mean to me? If you see a conditional, if you see the word if, it means there's a condition for that to happen. Some of the times it's double conditionals. Sometimes it says if this and that. I put a square around the word and, because if I want this, I have to do this, but I also have to do that. 
If I just do this, I don't get what I want because half measures avail me nothing. And I think that's actually, I'll digress for just a second. It's one of the expressions in the big book. If Bill Wilson were alive, I'd ask him, I'd talk to him about it. Because it's very, in chapter five, in how it works, it talks about half measures avail us nothing. I don't believe that. Half measures don't get you half. You know what half measures get you? Sicker. You do this program halfway and watch what happens. Because you don't have alcohol to depend upon. All you've got is the resentment and all the nasty emotions and you don't have any way to put the flames out. And you become a royal pain in the backside. I try to watch my words today, you know? So I don't think Bill Wilson was, I think he was meaning something different, but half measures don't avail us half. They get you sicker. You don't get nicks, nay, bunk, a bub kiss, squat. You don't get diddly. You get sicker, all right? So I digress. So give this a shot. That's the, the, the 12 prayers and 12 meditations that I wanted to talk about. Some people have never meditated before, all right? So I wanted to talk about meditation for a second. And meditations, there's nothing fancy about meditation. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, <clears throat> all meditation means is to get into the present moment. Because in the Far East tradition, they talk about the chatter of a thousand monkeys gets in your head. And that's the, what I describe as the itty bitty shitty committee, you know, and you get all these little voices. And I've actually named my voices, you know, uh, I've got the judge, you know, the judge is always there, the judge, the jury and the executioner. The judge is the one that judges it. He hands it off to the jury. The jury co-signs the behavior and then the executioner tries to figure out how I'm going to get even with you. Right? If I can't get even with you right then, then all of a sudden I bring in a fourth character called the hitman. And the hitman will wait. He'll lie and wait for years until I can give payback, you know, if I'm in my sixth state, you know. There's a banker up there. There's, there's Romeo up there. Romeo thinks that he's God's gift to women, you know. He was the 13th stepper when I first got sober. You know, there's the spiritual man. There's the sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous who wants to be the sage in the group who doesn't want to be the bleeding deacon. But if he doesn't get his way in, in his group, watch him throw a little temper tantrum in my mind, right? And by the way, if you go to a group and there's people that know that group because of it's, oh, that's Joe Blow's group, get away from it. Anytime you have a group around one person, there's something wrong with that group. We let God speak through the group conscience. No group should be anybody's group. It should be our group. But that's my own little sidetrack. So how do you get into the present moment? You know, most of us know when we're out of the present moment because the hamster's on the wheel. The chatter of a thousand monkeys going off and all of a sudden your mind goes and says, oh, I got to get this done. I got to get the taxes done. I got to, oh, I got to go pick up groceries. Oh, I forgot my dry cleaning. Whatever it happens to be, it's in there. And if you've never had that, you're in the wrong room, first of all. <clears throat> Second of all, the way you test yourself is not in the morning, it's at night. When you lay your head on the pillow, if you can't immediately fall asleep, you got the chatter of a thousand monkeys, Something's wrong with your spiritual condition. My wife will tell you, she's sitting right over there, you're going to ask her, when I hit the, hit the pillow, sometimes she'll be in mid-sentence and I'm already asleep. I don't stay awake at night with the chatter of a thousand monkeys because I do this work, all right? Well, what's the, one of the quickest ways to get into the present moment is to do something that we all do something, somewhere between 17,000 and 23,000 times a day. Breathe. Just breathe. Faith Hill is one of the greatest spiritual teachers I've had in a lot of years with that song of hers, Just Breathe. Sometimes that's what it comes down to. When I get all worked up and I call my spiritual guy and I say, hey, you're not going to believe what's going on, he'll go, Dave, take a breath. And then he'll remind me. What I want doesn't matter. And if you're interested, I've got some stickers up here after the meeting. You can come up. It says, what I want doesn't matter. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a joke, but I put those. I needed that kind of visual reminder all throughout the day. What I want doesn't matter. I don't get a vote. Guys will call me and they'll tell me, oh, Dave, I got this problem, and they'll tell me the problem, and I'll go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you find a vote around your house someplace? Because you don't get a vote. I'm sorry, something's wrong here. Like, oh, you're right, you're right. You know, if nothing else, I always use the expression, be where your feet are. If you have to, lean forward and look down at your feet. We're right here in this room right now. If the chatter is trying to take you to work or to lunch or to dinner tonight or to the meeting you're chairing in an hour, you're not in the present moment. You're missing God. The only place you can find God is right here, right now. God will be in the future, but you can't go into the future yet because it's not the present. So you can't connect with God in the future, and God is no longer in the past. And if your mind's in the past, you're not in the present moment. That's what our ego, you know, Harry Tebow, I talked about him earlier. That's the job of your ego is to get you out of the present moment. And the way it does that, it goes into the past, it takes some bad experience, then it projects it in the future, is watch out, this is going to happen, 
And guess what it just did very creatively? It hopscotched right over the present moment, and you're no longer the only, in the only place you can connect to your power greater than yourself, the present moment. So the goal is just to get back to the present moment. One of the easiest tools, like I said, is breathing. We do it thousand times a day, thousands and thousands of times a day. But how, mo how often do we actually think about our breath? We don't. So everybody sit up in your chairs, all right? <clears throat> Put your feet squarely on the floor and be comfortable, all right? And imagine a string coming out the top of your head. Somebody just pulls you up really quickly and then lets you down. And what I like to say is relax with dignity so that you're not hyperextending your spine. You just want to relax with dignity. And if you're like me and you've got a little roly-poly around the front, nobody, nobody will look, I promise. Just pick it up and get it up over the top of the belt because we're going to breathe. <laughs> we don't want anything restricting our breath, all right? Hand position. You've got two different, really, there's a whole bunch of different ways. You can have your palms up. From the oriental traditions, if your palm's up, you're open. You're allowing God to send stuff to you. You're, you're receiving, because that's the position we do when we reach our hands out. We're open. If you turn your hands over, then you're not asking for something. You're just kind of sitting there, and you're, you're content. You're looking into yourself with your hands over. Some people will lay their hands open to each other, and they'll touch their thumbs as if they're cupping like a little egg or something between their hands, just so that they have something to do with their hands. All I care about is that you relax. I don't care whether up, down, left, right. Just relax. I don't want any stress or any tension in your hands, all right? And, and what I want you to do is to take two deep breaths into what's called the Tan Tien in, Japanese, in the Japan tradition. It's two inches below your belly button and two inches deep. So you're not going to breathe up in your chest, which we all tend to do when we get stressed. Most people in addiction breathe from the top of their chest. I want you to breathe into your belly, all right? So when I do it, I'm going to say, take two deep breaths really quickly, you know, a normal pace, but I want them to be controlled. This is the first thing I want you to do is going to be controlled so you have some control to start with. And then after that, just let your breath go and just see if you can experience it. You'll notice that when we started this, we burned a little sage and it, it, it irritated some people. Everybody said, what is that? You know what I did? I brought every one of you into this room with that sage because you smelt it and you went, wow, you weren't in the hamster. You were here. You were right here right now. Whether you liked the smell, whether you didn't like the smell, it brought you right here. I'm going to use a chime. See if you can hear the chime and how long you can hear the chime to bring you to the center, center moment. So what I'm going to ask you to do is take your two breaths, then listen to the chime, then I'm going to sit down, and we're just going to be quiet for, I don't know, 30, 60 seconds. We'll see, and we'll go from there, okay? Everybody got the instructions? All right, two breaths. Great. How many people heard somebody coughing outside? Fantastic. Guess what? You had to be here to hear that. That cough is never going to occur again at that exact same time. And what brought you the cough? The air you were breathing. The sound waves went through the air, and that's what you were focused on. It brought you into the present moment. Anybody hear somebody next to them that had a whistling nose? You know, one of those... And you're thinking, and your mind immediately went to... I wish they'd stop that because I'm trying to meditate here. It's all about me, right? <laughs> Guess what? You're in the present moment. When you get those thoughts that, where the hamster tries to get you out there again, your ego's trying to get you out of the present moment, once you are awake to it, just bring your mind back. It only takes a few seconds to do it. I try to do it at least every four hours to sit down and just take three, four minutes to be conscious of it and to, to say, God, your will not mine be done, and to take a little meditation. They're really doing, the last decade, they're calling it the year of the brain. They're doing some amazing studies on the brain. They're finding out all kinds of interesting information. A lot of the more progressive hospitals have started to do prayer and meditation. And they call it BHMR or something like that. 
And what they're teaching is breathing exercises combined with yoga for their terminally ill patients. And it, for the patients that actually pass, they're doing postmortems on them and they're studying their brains and they're finding some amazing statistics and studies. They're finding more gray matter, they're finding less chances of Alzheimer's. Uh, most of people in recovery have some tendency towards ADD or ADHD, where we tend to get distracted. Oh, look at the bird. You know, type <laughs> brain, that's how our brains work. You know, they're finding the premeditation when they do these studies and they, the people that have been praying and meditating on a regular basis, they do it for two or three weeks or a month and then they bring them back and they put them in, they put them in a simulator and they give them advanced tasks very quickly. And the people that have been praying and meditating can process through the tasks and focus down and get to the tasks that they need to quicker. It's helping, it's helping fight all kinds of brain diseases just by simple prayer and meditation. They're also finding very significant increases in white blood count, which is your immune system. It boosts your immune system. We are under siege from information technology. How many people have crackberries? They're calling them crackberries for a reason. You know, they did a study of uh, 22 and unders at, a, at one of the local at a, at a university in, in the states, and they found on average the kids were getting up three times a night to check their emails and their on their crackberries. Now you've got Facebook and you've got all these other information media that's a constant barrage and it's constantly vibrating. Well, in the big, big book, it talks about a day of rest. When was the last time you turned off every bit of information technology, no TV, no radio, no iPhone, no iPad, no i anything, and you just were? You know? When you're sitting there doing nothing doesn't mean you're doing nothing. You're doing something if you're conscious and you're awake to it. But most of us, our mind says, get me to whatever. I really want to be doing this, or I want to listen to this. I want, it. I want, I want, I want. That's selfish. We're supposed to be selfless. A wonderful technique. Who's got my raisins? Pass out raisins. I need everybody to get a raisin. All right? We need some raisins out there. All right? What I'm going to talk about, we talked about breath, right? Breath is one of those things we do anywhere from 17 to 23,000 times a day. How many people in here eat on a daily basis? Okay. How many people in here are concerned about their weight? Right? One of the reasons that I look this way is because I comfort eat. I don't know if any of you comfort eat. You know, anybody ever been upset with a relationship and eat half a gallon of haagen You know, yeah, yeah. All right. That's comfort eating. It, it, taken to an extreme, it can become morbid obesity, which can become an addiction in and of itself. All right? Well, one of the things that I'd like you to do, since you're doing this every day anyway, let's take one bite and one breath before every single meal, and we focus in on it. You can do your meditation as simple as that. So hopefully, when you, before you eat, you've washed your hands and you're ready to go, and before you dig in, you say a quick prayer of thanks. Thank you, God. I give you some gratitude for your food that's before you, all right? Now, before you eat, try taking a breath. Just do one breath in and focus. Get into the present moment, all right? And <clears throat> when you guys get to the back row, let me know about the raisins because I want everybody to have a raisin, all right? And then we're going to talk about a food meditation, which if you've never done a food meditation, it's cool. A lot of the uh, monks, they do meditation, but they, they go quiet. They're silent during their meditation, and they're meditating on their food. But very few people will tell you how to do it. And so I'm one of the crazies. I will tell you how I learned how to do food meditation. Um, everybody got a raisin? Nope, we got some here, and they need some raisins. All right. Jerry, you can light the candle, please. All right. <clears throat> Most people don't realize this, but when you're, when you're touching something, like the raisin, all right, you're feeling it in the palm of your hand, and we think of feelings. You know, you hurt my feelings. We use the word feeling all over the place. Well, here's one time when we really do use feeling. The thing is, you're not using one kind of feeling. There's a set of nerves in your hand that's weighing that, that's saying, oh, this weighs just like this. I've got this in my hand, all right? There's another set of feelings that's saying, this is the temperature of it. You ever been touch a hot stove and you come back so fast, you're thinking, man, that was red hot. It should have burned me. Why didn't I? Different set of nerves took over. Because the, person, the feelings that said, hey, let's see how much this thing weighs. Let's get the tactile sense. You'd be way burned. 
it's a different set of nerves, actually two different sets of nerves. There's something called proprioception, which is a fancy word, which means there's part of your brain that's taken up just knowing where your arms and your hands and stuff are at all times. And one of the worst diseases you can ever get is to lose proprioception. You know, you've all had it. You sleep on your, on your arm in the middle of the night and you roll over and you, oh, oh, you, I threw my arm out one night, threw it out of my own bed. It was like, whoa, what was that? It scared the hell out of me. It was my own arm. For temporarily, I lost my proprioception. I couldn't feel it. So part of what your senses are is it's telling you about this raisin. Look at the raisin. Everybody's raisin is unique. My raisin isn't the same as your raisin. We have a different raisin. That's part of the uniqueness. To look at your raisin, you can only be right here, right now, looking at your raisin. This little teeny piece of fruit that's in your hand, right? right? Everybody got their raisin, they see the raisin, they know their raisin. You can name your raisin if you want to, I don't care. <laughs> All right? Hold it up and see if you can smell your raisin. should smell different. Everybody gets a little bit different sense of smell. Some people smell very well, some people don't. Some people smell the person sitting next to them and they wish they were smelling their raisin. <laughs> All right? Now, take your raisin, put it on your tongue, but do not chew. Just taste your raisin. Feel the tactile sense of those little edges on your tongue. Can you feel the sweetness? Can you, can you sense the aroma in your nose even though it's coming through your tongue, the taste? Now, move the raisin around in your mouth. Let it touch the top of your tongue, the back of your teeth. Don't chew it yet, not yet. Don't steal that piece. Let's just feel your raisin. Everybody got it? Now, bite into it and feel how the texture changes while you chew. It's getting a little mushy. You're adding a little saliva. The flavor is more pungent. It's sweeter. The taste is dripping down your tongue. What a sensation. Smell it again with your tongue. Smell it like the snake. Wow, get the flavor. When you're ready and you've chewed it, swallow it and feel it go down your throat. Now that's a unique eating experience that only you had. Your experience was different than your experience than your experience. Everybody had a unique experience in the present, in the now. That's the cool deal about an eating meditation. And you're going to do it three times a day probably, some of us more. So why not take a second and thank God for it Take a quick breath in, get yourself in the present moment, get a hamster off the wheel, and then eat one bite. All I'm asking is one bite of whatever it is. If it's haagen it's haagen If it's a raisin, it's a raisin. If it's yogurt, I don't care what it is. Enjoy the moment. And you'll find that over, after a while, you'll do it more and more and more. Make sense? Cool. The last, there's two more things I want to talk about. One is what traditionally they call a meta-meditation, which is really like a mantra. It's like a chant. One of the typical ones, and you can use anything you want as your topic. Normally, people repeat in threes when they do it. What I was taught by a guy out in Long Island was, may I be well and happy, may I be free from anger, may I be free from suffering. Those were the three chants. I've modified them a little bit. I still do well and happy. May I be free from anger and suffering, right? And then I ask for free from selfishness, right? When I do that, I'm saying it in my mind's eye. I'm not actually saying it out loud, although sometimes when I'm by myself, I will say it out loud. People look at you strange when you're in the market and you're talking to yourself. May I be well and happy. May I be free from anger. May I be free from suffering. Pick whatever you want. Whatever you want to bring into your life, and it begins with you. Start with that, and you just say it over and over and over again. They call that a meta-meditation. Once you get, you get that feeling in your heart where everything's okay, and you feel like you're in the present moment, then pick somebody you love. May they be well and happy. May they be free from anger. May they be free from suffering. And you can work your well all, way all the way up to, may the world be well and happy. May the world be free from anger. May the world be free from suffering. It's another technique. I took a piece from that because I wanted to give it to somebody else, and I came up with something I call, like to call the love light meditation. Ever stare at something like the flame of that candle, and you stare at it, and you stare at it, and you stare at it, and then you close your eyes, and you can still see the light in your mind's eye? That's why that candle is there, all right? So what I'd like you to do is pick somebody that you love. It could be a child. It could be your best friend. It could be your sponsor. Just somebody that you, you love in your heart. You've got no aggression, you know, no anxiety. You just love them for who you love them for. You just got that warm love. Everybody got somebody in their mind, all right? 
And what I want you to do is I want you to stare at the candle for 10, 15 seconds and get that burning image in your mind and close your eyes. And when you close your eyes, I want you to try to imagine that white light dropping down. I call it the drop. Because remember, we've got to get out of our mind to find God, right? So when we close our eyes, we can see the image in our mind. Drop it down into your heart of hearts, into your soul, into your guts, and feel the love. And, don't, and feel, see if you don't just feel it cooking inside of you. You just get this warm feeling comes over you. Then get the image of that person that you started with and see if you can, in your mind's eye, send that feeling to them, almost like you could just throw it to them and feel what you feel. See if you have an experience with it. That's a love light meditation. It'll only take a few seconds, but I've used this meditation at where I've sent love light and then I'll call the person up and they'll say, you were just meditating for me, weren't me? I got this image of your head in my mind. You know, you got to stop it. I was in the middle of a business meeting and all I could see was your smiling face. <laughs> you know, I appreciate you, bro, but you got to back off. <laughs> it's like, okay, I know it got through. It, the experience isn't for them. The experience is for you to develop compassion and love in your heart to somebody you already love to enhance that, all right? So let's see if we can give that a try. Let's stare at the light for 10, 15 seconds, see if you can get it in your mind's eye, and see if you can get the drop, and if you have any experience in your gut with it. And don't forget to breathe. Short and sweet. If me talking brought you out of that and you wanted to go back there, you did it right. How many people saw color, purple or green, showed up in their eyes? There's a couple of you. you this is probably not your first go around. You've probably meditated before. For me, when I go with the love light, it turns purple. I don't know why I get to see purple in my eyes. Everybody's different from what they tell me. And I imagine I sent love light to, light to my wife. I don't know whether she felt it or not, but I felt love inside me and I connected to that feeling. Most of us have been so wounded as kids, we don't let anybody in near Pandora's box, which means we suppress the bad stuff, but we also suppress our feelings and our emotions. And as you can tell today, I'm a crybaby because I've worked thousands of hours to try to tap into that. Because if I'm gonna be a human being, not a human doing, I have to connect to my, I call it my girly side, which is probably disrespectful to the girls, but I call it my girly side. I gotta connect to my emotions in order to be able to be compassionate, to be able to be tolerant and loving and kind as we go forth. These are just some, some techniques. You can get a thousand different techniques. Lying down meditation is fantastic. They, you can do the body scan. That's what they teach at the hospitals. We either start at the top of your head or at the tips of your toes and you work your way through and you'll feel little aches and pains and aggravations and you just let them go. And before you know it, you're completely relaxed. And if you fall asleep, that's okay. When you wake up, you can go back to your meditation. And you'll, but you'll have one of the most restful sleeps you've ever had, little cat naps. I call them power naps. You, know? you can do it sitting. You do the breathing meditation. Standing meditation. If you like to go out, if you're an outdoors person, what stands better than a tree? It spends its entire life standing, and it's rooted in the ground. So you go out, and you find a pretty tree that you like, and you sashay up right next to it. You say, excuse me, I'm going to get up in your space. And you imagine yourself rooted in the ground. And you listen. You listen to the wind blowing and the breeze, it'll come in and it'll fill you up, you know? What I'd like to do now is the seven, we're gonna pass the seven tradition basket since this is a, is a meeting, and I'd like JR to come up and share some of his experiences. You can hear it all mine. I know that he's been doing prayer meditation for a while, um, and let him talk for a little bit, and then if somebody else has any other exp experience, there's a thousand and one different meditations. The key is, why do we meditate? We meditate to get into the present moment so that we connect to the God of our own understanding. Because if you're not in the present moment, you're going to be in your addiction. You're going to be going through life. How many people have driven somewhere, some point in their life, and they had six different ways to get there, and they got there, and they couldn't remember how they went? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. We do that in our entire lives sometimes. We go through our lives thinking we're awake when we're sound asleep. Talk about dangerous. 
Let's get into the present moment and connect to God and see where God takes us. It brought me to Texas. You never know. <laughs> JR, you're up. Thank you, Dave. Um, I am JR Harmer, and I'm a real alcoholic. JR. And it's uh, great to be here. Meditation for me is a, is a very important tool. It's a tool that I can use at a, minute, at a moment's notice. And uh, since, you know, uh, along about the same time that meditation came into my life, the value of a moment came into my life. And moments are, uh, you know, every, every uh, hour is made up of minutes. Uh, minutes are made up of seconds. And seconds are made up of moments. And uh, this very moment, I want to congratulate you all and thank you all for being part of this spiritual body that has come together at this very moment. Th this moment will never happen again. The moment that I just spoke of will never happen again. These moments are, are very valuable, valuable. And each moment is all that we need to be concerned about. You know, uh, Eckhart Tolle talks about the moment and the now. And nothing takes, takes place anywhere but in the moment. Um, we, have, we had moments prior to this moment, and we will have moments in, the, in, the, in what we call the future of this moment. But each one of those moments will be that moment when they happen. See, we talk about the past and we talk about the future. Neither one of those are really very important. Those are but memories and projections. The, the moment that we're in at this moment is all we really need to be concerned about. The, this moment is all that we can really do anything about. When, when my children were born, I have one that's 26 and one that's 25. When they were born, it was not 25 or 26 years ago. When they were born, it was, a, it was that very moment that that took place. Now I have a memory of that, but it, but it was that moment that really counts. And, and when something happens in my future, someday I will probably pass away. Need I be concerned about that this moment? I think not. Because when that incident, when that action takes place, and God chooses to take me to wherever he chooses to take me that will be that moment and then I need to be concerned about that moment but right now I don't need to worry about that so the moment is very valuable now now meditation is a moment thing when I when I'm able to go into meditation I am no I quiet my mind to the point where I am not concerned about what we call the past and I am not a bit concerned about what we know as the future time is man made and those two things are moments in time this very moment the moment of, that I am able to clear my mind is what is important and at that moment when my mind is clear is when God, the, power, the higher power of my understanding, can make contact with me. We, uh, we talk about prayer and meditation. You know, one, one is transmitting and one's receiving. And uh, I think that prayer without meditation is like biscuits without gravy. You know, uh, why, why on earth would you uh, go to the breakfast table and, and have some nice warm biscuits and a big bowl of gravy and not put a little gravy on those biscuits? I just don't understand it. So um, please, 
put a little gravy on your biscuits, dry biscuits just don't work very well. Um, another, th another thing I'd like to talk about is the dash. What, what time we got? We're 10 out of oh, 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 one more oh, Okay. Uh, the moment, you know, when we, uh, I heard this, I heard this uh, not too long ago, six, seven years ago, and it's always stuck with me very strongly. When, when, when that day does come that God chooses to take each and every one of us from this, this place to wherever he chooses to take us, which a lot of us call heaven, um, we're born and we die, and on our, on our headstones there is the date that we're born and, and the date that we die. And then in, in between those is a dash. Okay, so we got four numbers over here. We have a simple dash in between and four numbers over here to signify to, to one illustrates our coming in and one illustrates our going out. The smallest thing in that is the dash. And that is the moment. And that is the thing that is the, means the most. What are you going to do on your dash? What is your dash going to signify? Please allow your dash to be as full as mine has been already. Thank you very much. If you haven't figured it out, my talk this morning was leading you to this. There's going to be a talk tomorrow morning that I'm going to be doing on transparency. And we're going to take some of these principles and I'm going to show you how to apply them. Who in here has ever had a relationship? Okay. We're going to talk about some of that tomorrow. And we're going to talk about the application and how you create vision in your life. You know, we talked about the nine-step pair, patience, tolerance, kindness, and love towards our family. That's a living amend right out of the book, you know. Between now and then, I have two homework assignments for you. Number one, spend some time with the breath inside of the breath, which is God. The second thing I'm going to ask you all to do is go out and make the world a better place because you're in it and you're sober. Uh, if you listen to this on CD, my email address is aadave1, the numeric character, at AOL.com. If you want a copy of this flyer, these, the 12 and 12, send me an email and I'll send it out to you and we'll sh share some fellowship in cyberspace. Thank you very much for your time. Everybody, uh, they've got a Spanish-speaking meeting here and there's plenty of other meetings every hour. Yeah, there's a woman waving in the back. What do you got? Seventh tradition, tradition come back? Oh. Well, let's get a basket by each door and you can throw it in on the basket on the way out the door. Thank you. Appreciate you. We hope you enjoyed this recording. If you are interested in other speaker tapes or CDs from AA or Al-Anon, please contact us at Sound Solutions, toll free, 1-877-893-2777, or visit us on the web at soundsolutionsrecording.com. We are also available to cover your recording and sound system needs. Thank you for allowing us to be of service and carrying the message.